On legibility, this is a one school for all uh, lecture by me, Andrew Thomas, um, for my international students to watch by Tuesday, the 19th of September, 2023. So of all the forms of art, sculpture, oil painting, song, playing the didgeridoo, whatever it is, why do we learn calligraphy first? Um, and this is a question that I find um, Norwegian teachers in Norway, but also English teachers in England and German teachers in Germany, wherever you are, um, they should be asking themselves, and they sometimes do ask themselves all the time, because on the surface of things, a lot of them want to be um, talking about um, the literature, the wonderful things that their language gives them access to or gives their pupils access to. Um, but it would be naive to think that people spend so many hours of the week in school, um, in Norwegian classes, because it's so important that they understand Ibsen, or Hamsen, or, um, or Goethe, or whoever it is this uh, literature um, gives you access to, or this, these language skills gives you access to. Um, we learn to write because we need to be able to communicate. Um, and in school, we learn to write because we learn we need to be read. Teachers need to be able to read the pupils' work in order to find out what they know and what they don't know. The discipline of writing and the discipline of writing in a particular language renders us legible. We can be read. And we're going to look a little bit of, um, at the skill of reading pupils um, in this lecture, but also this is, of course, very relevant for your work requirement. So, um, so in the in September two thousand and twenty-three, um, the twenty-ninth of September, actually, um, X, formerly Twitter, uh, will be launching its new functions and a privacy policy, which might involve the ability to harvest biometrics about you, about any users of um, X, such as job status. And, um, and Elon Musk says this would be useful if X is going to be used to recruit um, and, and to give you an opportunity to find good and relevant jobs. And people are worried about this, and there are um, hearings in national political bodies such as the Congress in the US, um, because we are addicted to something we are also appalled by, because our data is being harvested. And this is a public debate that I think is probably familiar to you. And, but we are addicted to it. We do love it. I love this. You know, I, I love having control over the way in which I'm, I present myself to the world. Um, we, we like to think of ourselves as um, beautiful, unique snowflakes, as, as flowers in uh, a garden that we look after ourselves. Um, but you can look on these flowers both as a flower, but also as something to be harvested. What we do on, online is an expression of who we are, but it is also something that allows us to be read, to be analyzed and ultimately marketed to. Um, and, and it is precisely when we act as self-expressive beings, as artists, that we are particularly readable. And we worry about where this data is, where our likes are, um, uh, what our likes tell us or tell others about us. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later in the semester. Um, and we want to know who has access to this gallery of Andrew, who is streaming my life, who is um, following me, um, and who is um, who wants to know what is going on in the next episode of season three of Andrew's life, the midlife crisis. Um, because my um, personal behavior, what most expresses my life is also my legible behavior. So that's one way of looking at data about us. There is another uh, way of looking at it. Um, and that is that um, there are conditions to our legibility. Um, before we render ourselves legible, we need to introduce ourselves. And for Facebook, um, these conditions are that we have a profile, or similarly X, 
um, that we have filled in particular amounts of information, that we have filled in some boxes, that we are active um, either here or elsewhere. Um, if we've got cookies activated, that will amount to the same thing. But there are also conditions for being legible in other situations for sociologists or demographers. Uh, we need to be able to fill in a form, a census, for example. Um, and for psychiatrists or people who are harvesting psychometric data, uh, we need to be, be able to tell some kind of truth about ourselves. And of course, self-knowledge is difficult. It requires, in addition to be able to fill in forms or reading and writing on forms, uh, perhaps certain virtues um, such as humility or honesty, but also the ability to go into certain kinds of relationships like a therapeutic relationship. Um, maybe we need to have a, a, a personal identification number in order to fill in forms. We need papers and an identity. Um, and in states and political and, and legal situations, that, that is a condition um, for us to be able to claim our rights as well. So all of these institutions and these scientific practices, uh, they produce knowledge and you can follow the knowledge and find out what happens to this knowledge about you, but it also assumes some kind of discipline, the discipline of writing, this discipline of self-knowledge. And it is tempting to follow the data, and that is what we tend to talk about in in um, terms of um, of the Facebook data. What are you doing with my data? But it is also important that we look at the conditions of the data. And, esp and especially in a classroom, we need to look at um, what... What that does to our pupils when we harvest the data that we that we do harvest in um, disciplines such as assessment for learning and um, and the observations that I can, the conditions of identifying needs in special needs education. So, um, in the work requirement, you will be reading classes, and um, and we are familiar with the possibilities that that opens in terms of special needs education, in terms of organizing classrooms, in terms of maybe triggering a special uh, a state of exception. Um, and and we are familiar with the criticisms of that kind of data in the discourse about um, X and Facebook. But the Scott book, Seeing Like a State, um, gives you a, a, lot, a lot of real-life historical um, stories that tell us what it looks like when we produce data, um, what the actual data production looks like, and what kind of sacrifices you make um, and states have have, had to make in the history of producing data. For example, the practice of getting children who maybe don't like to sit down in one place for a very long time to sit down and fill out a form or spend an entire lesson on something which isn't necessarily learning. Um, persuading children to describe themselves in particular ways. Um, teaching them to problematize their own selves in ways that they might not find natural. What this amounts to is that you can you can look at classrooms, you can look at education as the setting in which children learn to read and write, to think about politics and maths and natural resources, and all of those are important and necessary to acting as an adult. But we also need to accept that our classrooms are also places in which children learn to answer que questions such as, what is your name? What is your age? What is your gender? But also, are you happy? How do you relate to other people? How do you feel, really? And all the categories and nuances involved in what are you doing with your emotions? What are you doing with your internal monologue? Our classrooms are places in which pupils learn to make themselves legible.